Thank you, Philip uh, and Alina and Mike very much for the second invitation to speak. Gosh, I love the number theory web seminar. Uh, I really appreciate the organizational effort you guys put in every year. Um, and thanks everyone who's joining wherever you are in the world. Um, I'd like to tell you about the Bazoo identity and North Spring Quadratic Extension. Um, this uh, first slide is already a lie. Uh, Matt Damon or the uh, Matt Damon-like uh, amalgam hasn't yet signed on to the uh, movie project that's indicated here, but uh, I don't know, we're working on it. Um, this is joint work with Donald Cartwright and Xavier Rouleau. And uh, yeah, I'm this is uh, I'm leaving Dartmouth College and moving to the University of Sydney soon. So if, uh, I'll see you down under or upside down next time. Okay, what is the Bazoo identity anyway? Well, um, so in the beginning, there are two positive integers a and b. We let their GCD be g, and the theorem, which is referred to as the Bazoo identity says that there exist integers u and v with the property that a times u minus b times v is equal to g. I can think of no better way to start a number theory web seminar. I don't know where you guys are in your academic calendar. Uh, here in North America, we're either done with our semester or um, about to be done here on the quarter system. So it's uh, I've, I've tried to, I don't know, reach out and imagine what our summers could be like. Uh, so I'll try to keep that tone throughout the talk. Um, but actually, I'd like to problematize. Do you guys refer to this as the Bazoo identity? Actually, um, let's. Uh, I'm going to spend the first little bit uh, digging into that aspect. Um, so here's uh, Etienne Bazou, um, and uh, why is it that this is referred to as the Bazoo identity? The best uh, that I could come up with is that he proved it for polynomials. So this is the same bazoo of if you take the intersection of two plane curves, then count it with multiplicity, and under the appropriate hypotheses, the number of intersection points is the product of the degrees. So here it's probably a little bit hard to see, but uh, here's one of his uh, um, manuscripts. And uh, right here, you should see some polynomials that are equal to zero labeled L and L prime. And what he does in this uh, um, quite elaborate uh, algebraic construction is basically tell you how to write down the resultant of those two polynomials. The resultant is, uh, uh, is one when the polynomials are co-prime. And this construction on the right-hand side really tells you how to write the uh, corresponding polynomials, uh, you know, u of x and v of x. So, it may be appropriate to call it the Bazoo identity because of this generalization to polynomials, but I don't know. Um, where do you actually learn the Bazoo identity? Um, I guess all of us here read Bourbaki first, right? That's how we learn mathematics. You, you start at the beginning with uh, the element de mathématique. Um, so this is, for example, where the Bazoo identity is uh, you know, given such a name. It's a little bit funny because it's in quotation marks or French French quotation marks. So I, I guess uh, maybe we should interpret those as air quotes um, in, okay, I'm trying to imagine Bourbaki writing air quotes, but I, I, th that may be a reasonable interpretation of what that is. This is the most general version. Um, and uh, if you have a PID, then, you know, an appropriate notions of GCD, then you can write one as a linear combination. And perhaps uh, in the lineage of Bazou's generalization to polynomials, when we have it in this level of generality, it's okay to refer to it as the Bazou identity. But I don't know. Um, if you go to Vey and look at what he refers to as, uh, you know, where did this actually arise in history? Um, he claims that any method for understanding solutions to equations like ax minus by is equal to m is essentially identical with the Euclidean algorithm. And, you know, that's actually how I learned it when I was a kid, too, um, in number theory classes. It was only later when I heard people referring to the Bazoo identity and I said, wait, I thought that was just the Euclidean algorithm. Um, Vey seems to agree and says, you know, solving one is so close. Um, uh, to like the continued fraction or the method by which um, you compute the GCD that solving the, um, the equation AX minus BY is really no different. In fact, he notes that uh, 
Um, there's also uh, uh, in, an independent discovery other than Euclid in the uh, Sanskrit texts uh, that date from the fifth or sixth century uh, uh, in the common era. And this is the uh, pulverizer method um, that, uh, uh, so th this type of discovery is not just, um, you know, it's so important it's been rediscovered in lo lots of places. If you go back to the original Euclid, um, oh, all right, all right. Going back to the original Euclid might be a little bit hard. So here's here's the the uh, 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 transcription and translation of what it is. This is uh, book seven and proposition two. So this is where he um, explains how to compute the GCD of two numbers. He, he does it in terms of lengths um, and whether or not those lengths can be measured with respect to one another. So it's like, is there a multiple of one that gives you the other? And that's, you know, we usually, this is like, this is the division algorithm that allows you to compute the GCD. And uh, um, in the end, he really does, uh, you know, through this argument show, for example, this corollary, if a number measures two numbers, then it will also measure their greatest common measure. And if you really work that back, I mean, it's not written in the language of uh, modern mathematics, surely, but that um, he also doesn't really uh, um, explain multiple steps. He only does it in one step. But still, I, I, uh, 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 I, I'm convinced by they that uh, this probably is not the Bazoo identity, at least over the integers. It, it should be referred to as the Euclidean identity or something like that. Um, we'll probably still have Matt Damon uh, play Euclid, I guess, in the movie version. Um, but uh, um, I think Andrew Granville is going to uh, really dig into this perspective on things and this historical note to try to, I don't know, problematize the um, the naming it of the Bazoo identity by Borbaki and in other places. But all right, so that's our first... Uh, um, uh, real uh, delves back into the history of things. I have one other fun anecdote. Um, I don't know why it is in number theory and in mathematics that there's so many things that are named and then not for the right person. Um, but uh, they notes one other place. So where was it like first written down um, in some kind of uh, mod, you know classical notation, not measuring in terms of lengths after Euclid? Um, this is uh, Bachet, Claude Gaspar Bachet de Mesirac. Um, and they note that uh, Bachet, blissfully unaware of uh, the work of Euclid and his Indian predecessors, claims this method for uh, writing AU minus BV is equal to one. Um, he does a bit more actually giving a complete parameterization. And so, all right, it's a little bit. Um, uh, Maybe there's another, if you wanted to attribute this, uh, uh, maybe, maybe another person that we could attach to the project uh, would be Bache. All right. Well, uh, I guess we got to get back to work. So starting again, um, let's take two positive integers, A and B. And uh, without loss of generality, we can suppose that their GCD is one by dividing through by the GCD. Um, one thing I hope that you'll get out of this talk already or have gotten out of this talk is that uh, the name of the Bazoo identity, maybe we should refer to it as the um, some combination of the U Euclid, Bachet, Bazoo identity to indicate uh, uh, Euclid was where it was found first. Bachet gave us, uh, you know, a first modern statement, you know, equals one. And Bazoo showed us that it was really a more general phenomenon belonging to, to PIDs or something like that. So it says there are U and V such that AU minus BB is equal to one. Okay, so the main question for today, um, given that there exist integers u and v, we're going to be obsessed with trying to put additional conditions on the integers u and v. So that's that's uh, that's going to be our goal. Um, you might wonder all kinds of things about what we can say for u and v. Maybe you might want to know that they're separately primes, maybe smooth numbers. Um, uh, I hope that I've stimulated your mind and you've got your favorite point of view of questions that come from number theory. I believe there is a version that uh, could apply to this, uh, this type of situation. So um, I'll let your mind run. 
maybe before we dive in uh, deeper into this main question, uh, I kind of broke symmetry a little bit uh, when I wrote a times u minus b times d is equal to one. So you might wonder why I put the sign there. You'll, you'll see that in a second. Um, and maybe to restore symmetry, I hope you agree that if you swap a and b, then you're swapping the sign. So uh, to restore that symmetry, we may also want to consider um, the, what I'll call the unsigned equation, uh, where I take a u minus b d as plus or minus one. Okay, well, let's do a little review of what types of things that we can say uh, for these bazoo coefficients. So first of all, you can find one solution using the uh, extended Euclidean algorithm, the existence of them. And then all of the rest are parameterized like this. So uh, u is the original one plus b, and d is the original one plus a. That is one justification for writing the negative sign here, because it allows you to just have the pluses in both, both cases here. Um, this is what it looks like geometrically. It's a line a u minus b d is 1 in the plane. Um, and uh, all right, that's I drew that for you. So um, one thing that we can ensure is that uh, u and v written in this way are really, um, we can assume that they're both positive. That's supposed to be clear from the picture that I just take the primitive points on this line, the integer points, the slope being exactly a over b because I've assumed that the GCD is equal to one. And of course, in number theory, we never treat the, the real place differently than, than the other places. Um, and what I mean by that is, you can also uh, ensure that u and v satisfy any congruence conditions. I mean, they're not allowed to be arbitrary. Uh, I, I can't pick u and v arbitrarily necessarily modulo any, any uh, uh, possible modulus m, but uh, maybe the way I could phrase this that I hope sounds reasonable is, okay, if you pick your modulus m and then you pick two elements, uh, u1 and v1 mod m, such that you have a solution to this equation mod m. So I'll call those allowable congruence conditions. Sort of like, can you lift uh, something mod m? And the answer is yes, you can lift it. You can find positive integers if you like u and v, such that a u minus b v is equal to one and that uh, agree with the original ones uh, mod m. So if, you're, uh, if you want, I, I title this slide weak approximation. Any finite number of congruence conditions that doesn't contradict the equation itself um, you can ensure that uh, your solution satisfies those as well. So it's really a wealth of, uh, of possible uh, uh, specializations that we could make. If you wanted to consider other conditions on u and v, like I was saying prime or semi-prime or in an arithmetic progression itself or something, this uh, mechanism shows you what the additional constraints are that you're putting on it, what type of problem that you end up with. All right, well, um, we're just getting started here. This was uh, the, the first uh, and easy things that we could say about the coefficients. I guess, uh, what other conditions could we possibly put on u and v? Um, I'm going to say, let's, let's, uh, let's ask if u and v can be taken to be integer squares. That seems like a pretty good, uh, this will serve as, a, I hope, a, a natural uh, question to ask in the first place. I mean, it's sort of like, can you take the winner Fibonacci number squares? You know, it's in that, that spirit. Um, and it will be a good warm up for my actual uh, main uh, result. It should, kind of gives a good outline for what the proof should look like. All right, so can we, uh, um, can we take these uh, coefficients that appear in the, so the identity um, themselves to be squares? Okay, so when you plug in for u and v, you need to solve this equation, ax squared minus by squared, equals, let's say, plus or minus one, uh, keeping the symmetry in, in A and B. All right, so what type of Diophantine equation is that? Well, hmm, I mean, it's a quadratic equation. That's one thing. So you're probably thinking that it is almost a Pell equation. The Pell equation would be of the form x squared minus something y squared equals one. That something is going to be C. We really can make it look like that. Um, so uh, let's take C to be A times B. So there's uh, one kind of special and degenerate case where C is equal to one. That can only happen when A and B separately are equal to one. Um, that is not a difficult equation to solve. X squared minus Y squared is plus or minus one. We don't uh, need to spend more time there. 
And otherwise, uh, since A and B are relatively prime, um, necessarily then C will be a non-square integer once I assume that it's greater than one. Okay, and to make it into an actual Pell equation, just multiply through by A. So if you do that, you get plus or minus A, and then you can pull in the A into the X, B times A being equal to C. Why do I say an almost, um, uh, almost Pell equation? Well, um, this is where, just like in the Pell equation, you can factor that now as the difference of two squares over the field where you would join a square root of C. And maybe another name for this type of equation would be uh, that it's a norm equation. So the norm here is uh, uh, from the field Q adjoined square root C, and I just take AX plus the square root of C times Y. So that's the, um, the type of Diophantine equation that we're working in. We should sort of expect this. The left-hand side is a binary quadratic form. So somehow it should be related to quadratic forms with discriminant C. And this is the, uh, the way that I'd like to describe a solution to this equation. Now, um, it's a little bit, it's sort of, if, uh, I mean, the A appears here in two places. One of them is that I want the value now to be plus or minus A. And the other is that uh, I'm asking that my coefficient, you know, when I plug in there is divisible by A. So I want to find an element of norm plus or minus A, but I want it to be of this form. So let's just gather all of the elements um, that are multiple of A times an integer plus um, integer multiple of the square root of C. I'm going to call this guy little fractor A, and I'm going to think about that as a subset of elements inside Z adjoined the square root of C. Okay, so I really am looking for a norm uh, from there. All right, well, it is not hard to show that this uh, fractor A is an ideal of Z square root C. In fact, it's uh, um, an invertible ideal, locally principal, and if you take the subset of all of the possible norms of elements that you get from the ideal A, and you take their GCD, or you consider the ideal generated by all of those norms, then you get exactly A times Z. All right, so I was looking for an element from fractor A, which has norm plus or minus A. And I know that the norm of the ideal is actually equal to A, um, the ideal generated by A. And um, it is not hard to show that this really does uh, require that element to generate the ideal fractor A. So um, if I want to solve AX minus BY squared is plus or minus one, I've shown you that that's equivalent to finding, you know, solving this norm equation. So I can consider this element AX plus the square root of CY. What do I need to know about that element? Well, I need it to have norm plus or minus A, and that is equivalent because the norm of the ideal is equal to A, to just saying that this fractor A is a principal ideal generated by this X plus Y square root C. All right, so um, I hope that makes sense. This is, uh, what's the way to think about this proposition? Well, if there is, we want to know, is there a solution to this equation? I've said there is a solution if and only if this ideal A that I wrote down inside some quadratic ring is principal, you know, generated by X plus Y root C. And so that allows us to label an obstruction to the existence of a solution, uh, you know, a necessary and sufficient condition. I just need to look at the class of this ideal inside the class group of Z square root C. Whereas usual, uh, this uh, ring Z square root C need not be the ring of integers. So I do restrict myself to invertible elements, um, uh, modulo principal elements. Um, and that uh, allows us to know what when the equation has a solution plus or minus one. If you really care about the sign here, then that means that you don't want um, then equivalently, let's say you want the plus sign. Then you want an element whose norm is A not minus A. You can repeat the same argument, and then you know that if the norm is A um, up to choosing a sign uniformly, um, this, the norm of this element is totally positive. And that's equivalent then to asking for this class not to be trivial in the class group, but in the narrow class group, where you nod out only by um, totally positive elements. So that's a slight extension, slightly maps surjectively to the class group. But that's how you would modify this argument if you wanted to not, you know, to asymmetrize the equation. 
And one other upshot from this is that you see all solutions arise. Once I have a solution, so I know the ideal is principle, if I want to know what are the possible solutions, well, given one, they all differ by, oh, this D should be a C. I apologize for that. Um, the, uh, The um, any two generators will differ by a unit. You could also ask for that to be a totally positive unit, which would then be norm one if you want the narrow class group. And that group is generated, the, the, the units of Z root C are still generated by these things that come from the Pell equation. So um, you might think of this as being like a, 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 a torsor over the Pell equation. And once you have one, then you get to see all the solutions by modifying them by this fundamental unit or a, pow a power of it up to plus or minus one. Okay, great. How did that go, everybody? Is that really clear? So to solve, to ask if they're squares, what's the deal? We need to, um, there are many ways of thinking about it, but I think this is illuminating. You identify the obstruction in a class group, and then once you have, you get all solutions by, um, by multiplying by units. So you can really interpret this um, inside the ideal or module theory of, uh, of a ring. Okay, so um, I'll fix this one more time. Uh, to show you, uh, just to give us a little breather from the slides, um, if I take the equation 5x squared minus 29y squared is plus or minus 1, this is an example where there is no solution over z, but there is a solution over q. So you plug in 3 quarters, 1 quarters. It's, it's, it's always easy to be convinced and verify that there is a solution. To know that there isn't a solution in integers, you're really tempted to believe that there is one, given that there's a rational one. But those are the ghosts that are exactly the ghosts of the class group. So that's how you can be sure that you have an obstruction, kind of get your hands on it um, in this kind of labeled way. All right. So now comes the real content of today's talk after that warm up. I hope you're feeling motivated um, and uh, are following along. Um, I ask for uh, congruence conditions, then I ask for squares. And uh, today we are going to try to understand when I can take U and V to be norms from a quadratic extension. Okay, so we saw a norm equation on the previous slide that that was um, staying in the vibe of that. Um, it is a lot easier for an integer to be a norm from a quadratic extension rather than being a square on the nose. Um, there are a lot more norms than there are squares. Um, and so this is uh, should be easier to satisfy somehow. And uh, all right, let's see where we get to. So to motivate this a little bit further, um, I want to focus on an illustrative special case. So we really have some some things in our head as we're as we're um, going along. I'm just going to take this quadratic extension to be um, adjoining a cube root of unity. So let omega be this uh, primitive cube root of unity. Um, everybody knows the Eisenstein integers. They're z adjoin omega inside the field q omega, which is the same as the field q square root minus 3. And I'm going to be interested in the set L of norms from the field q omega um, restricted to the integer elements. So this is the set of norms from the Eisenstein integers. One of the first things you do in uh, after you uh, study the integers and you study their generalizations, the Gaussian and Eisenstein integers have many similar properties, including uh, being a UFD. What do these norms look like uh, given that property? Here's what the norm looks like. And if you complete the square, you see immediately that the only possible norms that you get are those that are 0 or 1 mod 3. And because it is a UFD, these are exactly the numbers that you get. If you wanted to think about it uh, written multiplicatively, how would you write down all integers that are 0, 1 mod 3? Well, you take 3, and then you take the primes that are 1 mod 3 and the squares of primes that are 2 mod 3. So those are all. that's what it means to, uh, um, to be a, I guess you would say, a monoid under multiplication, maybe. Um, these would be generators of that multiplicative monoid. It's free on these generators. Okay. So here's the thing that I learned working on this project. Um, this set L of norms of the Eisenstein integers 
it has its own name. They're called the Lucian numbers. Do you, do you guys know this? Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I thought I knew numbers, but uh, okay. There's, there's always something to discover. I guess even about uh, what we refer to as the Bazoo identity. Okay, why are they called the Lotian numbers? So uh, August Loesch was an economist, a German economist, and he was interested in, um, I guess, the market that comes from farms and was measuring, you know, like how long it takes for the wheat to come from a farm to come to market and it was doing some, some modeling there. And uh, here's a quote from a paper by Marshall, the Lucian numbers as a problem in number theory. He says, in practice, since both farms and market areas are hexagons, to measure a good approximation to what the possible distances are between these farms are, no, you know, the lengths of distances between the centers of hexagons. And that's exactly the set of Lucian numbers. So the norms of Eisenstein integers. Here's a little graphic of why something like that might occur. If you're irrigating your farm, then you really, like the bees would tell us to do, you'll get a lot more, um, cover a lot more area if you arrange them as hexagons. Um, I'm not sure how often this is really done. I mean, if you have to draw roads through these farms, they're going to be pretty crazy. I mean, I don't, I don't know. But if you play um, board games, then this is the typical configuration. I back when I was uh, had time for leisure activities, I would play a lot of uh, of Civilization, and there your the tiling system that is used really is hexagons, and that's really important when you want to to storm Washington D.C. You want uh, many ports of entry um, to to accurately represent things. Okay. So, uh, um, all right, so there's another little tidbit for you. Um, the, um, the Lucian numbers are a thing. All right, so um, just to make sure we're all still on the same page, the question that I'm asking is given co-prime positive integers, when are there Lucian numbers, norms from Eisenstein integers that are the coefficients of the Bazoo identity? A AU minus BV is plus or minus one. All right. Well, being about uh, a little more than halfway through my talk, it's a good idea to state a theorem. And our first the theorem is indeed, there are infinitely many such U and V that are norms, that are Lucian numbers. And we can add a little bit more. Uh, I hope you don't mind that I didn't write out allowable congruence conditions on this slide. There's a bit more that, um, if you can solve, you know, if U and V are norms from Z mod M Z adjoin omega in that in that way, so they lit, if you can, um, if the the if you have a solution mod M that looks like it comes from Lucian numbers, then it it does um, over the integers. Okay. Of, of course, the Lucian numbers are automatically positive. Um, I didn't remark that on the slide, but their lengths, uh, like we saw on the a sieve board. And here's an example of one of these allowable conditions that you might want to take. Um, if A and B are not 1 mod 3, then you can assume that 3 does not divide U and V, the product of U and V. Um, now, uh, since I am moving back and forth between the original identity and the unsigned identity, I just want to stress that this theorem is kind of best possible as stated. There can be an obstruction if you ask for, you know, A not B in this way. So here's an example. Um, if you take A, B is 5, 3, then, of course, 10 minus 9 is equal to 1. So that's a perfectly good um, uh, uh, solution to the, the equation. Um, remember that the general solution is um, you add a multiple of the other, and a multi, you know, if you're in the A coordinate, then you have multiple of Bs, and the B coordinate, you have multiples of As. So given the one solution, all such solutions are given by 2 plus 3t and 3 plus 5t. So can we solve this equation, AU minus BV, in Lucian numbers? The answer is no, we cannot. Um, 2 plus 3t is never a Lucian number, because it's 2 mod 3, right? So there's no way that you 
could ever be in L. But our theorem is not false. Um, if you swap the roles and interchange five and three, then, or that is to say, look at the equation equal to minus one, then you can do 20 minus 21 and you get minus one. Okay, so there's uh, the echoes of what we saw in the, um, the case of squares where there can be an obstruction to the equation. Um, here we see also that there could be obstruction to one of the two uh, when you think about the, the sine equation. And hopefully by the end of the talk, I will have a, um, a good understanding of where this, uh, hope you to understand where this comes from. Okay, great. So I put in a pause here in case there were, there's a chance to ask some questions. Um, after this, uh, I'm gonna tell you how to prove the theorem, what the main ingredients are. So this would be a good time if you've got something on your mind that you'd like to ask about. If not, that's okay too. I like to, these Zoom talks are a lot hard to follow. So uh, you're welcome to just stare out the window for about 10 seconds, just to take a little breather because we're about to uh, go a court. But is there a question? Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, well, so that theorem, uh, wh what's the date of that theorem? The date? Oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The... Um, uh, so, so that's one of your theorem, V, v is void. V, yeah, sorry, we always do that. This is a joint and, work. And I think so Donald and, uh, and Xavier proved this theorem uh, without me but they couldn't do all cases. Um, so there were some, uh, there was a situation where they couldn't quite count all of the things that they needed. And uh, as you'll see, I was brought on board for a particular reason and then we generalized it. And so this is a corollary of our main result. Um, but uh, the date is either 2023 for some version of this theorem or it will appear on the archive soon, a date 2024. Okay, I, I might be missing something, but so, why doesn't it follow from the fact that the set of all Lucian numbers, uh, so these are the norms of of elements in a quadratic field, so these would be uh, uh, like there's a there's, uh, isn't there a Dirichlet equidistribution theorem for these uh, numbers when you look at the if you intersect with the line uh, a minus b of slope a minus b. Uh, that I am I'm not aware of such a theorem. It sounds like it might be true. Um, how do you explain the the signed counterexample? Um, by congruent obstruction, maybe I'm, I'm okay. not sure. All right. So all right, I I, 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 I going don't... with that. I'm going to use a different proof that isn't analytic in its nature. But I do think that you have to identify an obstruction, and then once you do, um, there there is a an approximation theorem that really does allow you to hit it with a hammer. Um, I am gonna, I'm wielding my hammer, but uh, I think you have to set up this first part. That's that's contentful. But then afterwards, I think I think you're on the right track. Okay, I'll wait and see. Okay, yeah, that would be great. And I don't know that this, all right. Um, uh, 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 all right, I think that's a good sign for me to continue if that's all right. Um, so let's see why this is true and then we can, step back and say, it should seem obvious or clear, you know, that's a good sign that we're doing the right type of math. Doesn't this just follow from, yeah, yeah, we should we should feel like this is inevitable, but um, there, there must be something more to say than just it is elementary to derive because there really is, for example, this signed obstruction. And if you try to generalize it beyond the Lucian numbers, the class group of the imaginary quadratic field may come in to bear too. So that you have to somehow, uh, you know, identify that as, as, as intervening, but all right, good. I'm, I appreciate the spirit of that question. I agree. How, how hard could this really be? So um, with that bit of a pause, let's do, let's set up our general notation. Okay. So we're going to take an imaginary quadratic field um, that is necessary uh, to simplify some of the things that I'm saying are the most general results should not assume this, but uh, I'm going to do it for today. I'm not going to assume that it's uh, Q join omega though. Uh, my notation for the ring of integers is zk. And I'll, as, as before, label just norm nm the norm from k. Our goal is to find mu and nu integers because I want their norms to be integers. Um, 
and uh, um, that satisfy this equation. A norm mu minus B norm mu equals plus or minus one. That's my goal. Um, to really see what this looks like, I don't know why psychologically this was very helpful for me. If you go back to the Lucian case and you plug in what you get from the norm, this is the Diophantine equation that you want to solve. So just like in the, the spirit of the question that we got, um, you may want to um, think about what type of equation is this? Now it is not a almost Pell equation, it's in four variables. Okay, but it's still a quaternary quadratic form on the left-hand side is equal to plus or minus one. So whatever tools or techniques that you would like to bring to bear, this is our goal. That's the equation that we need to solve. Okay, but it has to be in integers, um, not, not rational numbers. So I'm pleased to say that uh, the approach that we took in the case of squares is going to uh, really apply in, in much the same way. Um, Remember what we did there. We rescaled the almost Pell equation to realize it as a norm equation. Then we identified the obstruction as lying in a class group. If we that obstruction vanished, then we found all of the infinite many solutions by multiplying one solution by units. So we got a complete parameterization. So we're going to adopt the same technique here. So how are we going to do that? Do you guys even see? a norm equation there. Does anybody out there see the norm? Um, well, do you, do you know me? I, I, I see quaternions everywhere. Um, do you see, uh, thank you, Dan. I appreciate that, yes. Um, the quaternions were coming and I can't believe it took me this long to get there, but uh, here we go. This is a quaternion norm equation or an almost quaternion Pell equation. Okay, so that's the equation we still wanna solve. Here's the quaternion algebra B um, that we will see that it comes from a norm equation. So D is the discriminant of the quadratic field. C is still A times B. So I remind you that even though you don't need to be reminded that quaternion algebras are defined by a basis one ij ij that satisfy these equations, I squared is D, J squared is C, uh, C was my A times B and I and J skew commute. I'll note, for example, because D and C are both positive, uh, sorry, D is negative, but C is positive, that uh, when you replace Q by R, that you get something isomorphic to two by two matrices. So B is an indefinite quaternion algebra. I also want to note this was chosen so that uh, when you look at the root D, you exactly get the copy of K, which is Q root D. So um, I'll label that I in the usual way for quaternions. Um, but anyway, you could think about B as being a, a left K vector space of dimension two generated by one and J. Um, the i's kind of come pairwise in both of those coordinates. And if you don't like to think about quaternions, quaternions are just one of the two by two matrices. Um, and this is how they realize themselves as, as a two by two matrices. You really can multiply them uh, purely uh, uh, in this way. This is the uh, right regular representation, uh, which is why we get things on the level of um, rows. The whole point of this is that you really are supposed to see a norm equation. So the norm, of mu plus mu j is the determinant of the two by two matrix that you get there. Um, that's mu mu bar minus c nu nu bar, which is the norm of mu minus c times the norm of nu. That's almost the equation up there, and it will be once I multiply through by a, right, everybody? I'm so, sorry, who, who is d? d is the discriminant of the quadratic field. Oh, the, okay. The, the, the field uh, adjoined omega that you had in the example before. Yes. I mean, the so field I, uh, from which you took. I'm looking okay. at a more general situation. Um, this was the notation that we set here. So uh, you can take D to be minus three, but I'm allowing an arbitrary K. Okay. And you're looking only for solutions in the ring of integers. That's right. Thank you. And we are not interested in rational solutions, but we really do want to restrict ourselves to integral solutions. So you may not, although you may have played with quaternion algebras, if you want the integral things, you know, things with an integral coefficient inside quaternion algebra, we need to uh, define and maybe study this. It's, it's called a cross product order. So it looks like this, but you just take the integer points instead. So you have to check that it's closed under multiplication, but it's a free Z module of rank four. It really should feel very comfortable. It's just, you know, no denominators allowed kind of uh, um, club. Okay, so um, I just repeated what was on the previous slide. I've got my order O inside the quaternion algebra B. 
Um, and now, okay, I don't know. Um, to kind of balance things out a little bit from the history, I want to show you a little bit of algebra. Um, and this slide is only meant to convince you that the order is nice and that we can do the necessary calculations on it to answer our question. So um, these adjectives, Gorenstein, uh, that the co-different is locally principal, and Bass, if every order that contains O is Gorenstein, these are supposed to make you feel very happy. Um, co-difference being locally principal is like the, um, the uh, canonical sheaf is invertible, that, you, that the differential forms really are locally free. Um, if you work on cryptography, then the Bass orders are the ones that allow you to find the maximal order when you uh, are trying to uh, uh, develop um, algorithms for solving the ideal problem uh, in super singular elliptic curve cryptography. So this is uh, these are the nice the nice orders. And the lemma is that the order O is a Bass order, and its reduced discriminant is just C times D. So it's not hard to prove the lemma once you know these things. If you're curious and want to know more, I wrote a slender volume um, that will explain all of this to you. Um, it's freely available and PDF searchable, so you can go right to where you need to. So search for the word Bass. Um, to tell you what, just a little bit more about the order, um, there's a local global dictionary that says that O is determined by its completion. So when you tensor O with ZP. So to tell you what O is, what property it has, I should really try to classify what happens when I tensor with ZP. And the way to do that is to look at the Jacobson radical. That's the intersection of all maximal left ideals of O. It's like the usual radical of a commutative ring, but you have to pick left or right because the ring is non-commutative. The whole point of the Jacobson radical is when you mod out by that, you get the maximal semi-simple quotient. Um, and this is a P always belongs into this radical because it is nilpotent, topologically nilpotent. So you get some finite dimensional FP algebra. And uh, this is a thing that I'm trying to make happen. So I'm taking a moment uh, now just to uh, explain it to you and encourage to read. Um, like I said, uh, one th thing about quaternion algebras is, and orders is they're one of E two by two matrices. Another way to think about them is that they are like non-commutative quadratic fields. So quadratic fields, you have primes that are either split, ramified, or inert. And quaternion orders are similarly also classified based on what you get when you mod out by this Jacobson radical. So one kind of weird thing is that you get, uh, if, if uh, sometimes it's just maximal and you get M2 of FP, otherwise, um, uh, if P divides the reduced discriminant, you have three possibilities. It's split in order ramified, according as this uh, quotient is either, you know, FP cross FP, FP squared, or FP, just like you would have for a, a quadratic extension. So the point of this slide that I hope you take away with is, uh, I don't know, we really can't get our, the order O is nice, and we really can specify what uh, locally this order looks like. So to show you a little bit, like to make this come alive, let's do it um, in the Lushian case. So this will give you a little flavor of uh, what I mean by we understand the local description. Um, if I take a prime P that does not divide three times C, then the order is maximal. If P divides C and P is one mod three, then it's residually split. If P divides C and P is two mod three, then it's residually inert. And uh, if P is three and three divides C, there's yet one case remaining, then o th this O3 is residually ramified. So um, does that make sense? It's sort of, it's really like capturing this, uh, it's almost like splitting of uh, primes, but it's in terms of the Jacobson. Okay, so let's summarize where we are. So we're, we want to solve A times norm of nu minus B times norm of nu is plus or minus one. We scale by A to recognize this is a norm equation. That was explained uh, just two slides ago. That comes from the determinantal representation or how you want to think about it. We want our A mu plus nu j to belong to the O because I would like mu and nu to be uh, integers. Now you guys remember what we did in the squares case, right? We have to define this ideal j, which contains all of the possible elements where I want to take them from. It's not enough just to take them from O, but I need the first coordinate to be a multiple of A. So I define this idea, the ideal, which is called J. Well, I define J and then I observe that is a two-sided or bilateral ideal. It's invertible, which is the same as being locally principal. And if you take, again, the ideal generated by all the reduced norms of all the elements in J, then you get A times Z. 
So for the same reason of the ideal generated by his finite index, and you can measure that by the norm, um, we will have a theorem, a proposition like we uh, like in the quadratic case. Before I set that up, I need to know something, something principle. So just as in the quadratic, just as in the commutative case, we define something called the right class set of O. And it's just a set of classes of invertible, equivalently, locally principle, right O ideals under the equivalence that I is equivalent to J if you get from I to J by multiplying by something from the field. It's a little bit nicer to think about this uh, equivalence classes rather than the quotient of one thing by the other. Because of non-commutativity, it's really not the quotient of one group by the other. It's really a set of equivalence classes. Okay, and then the proposition says, just like before, if we want to solve our, our equation in um, uh, uh, mu, and this should be a nu here, I apologize for that. That happens if and only if this ideal J is principal, generated either as a left, right, or two-sided ideal by this element alpha. So that was the punchline that uh, you, you, you can, you're following along, you could have predicted this from the quadratic case. Again, the obstruction lies in a class set now. It's not necessarily a class group because of the non-commutativity. And again, you also get in all of possible solutions, because if I have a generator or a principal ideal, then they all differ by multiplication on the left or the right. Uh, but one side is, a, is enough um, by multiplying by units. And what can you tell me about the set of units? Well, instead of just being plus or minus something to the z, uh, here it's an infinite, non-abelian, finitely generated group. That may sound unwieldy and maybe even unknowable, but um, if you restrict to the norm one subgroup, um, recalling that uh, the quaternion algebra is indefinite, so it looks like M2 of R. If I look at the things that have norm one, that's like inside SL2R. It's discrete, so it acts, um, this discrete group acts properly on the upper half plane. So you might think about this as being an analog of SL2Z but it is uh, coming from quaternions instead. So we really could understand this as like, a, it's like a, a group which is a surface group, um, but you have to allow possible orbifold structure too. So that, that's the type of uh, infinite group. Computable, there's a solution to the word problem. You know, we really can, we really can say something. Okay, and um, so how hard is it to uh, identify this element of the class set? That's our last task before uh, my talk is over. Um, in general, there's geometry of numbers arguments that tell you that this class set is at least a finite set, but I can be much more precise because this is an indefinite quaternion algebra. It satisfies something which is called strong approximation. Now, strong approximation, it's gonna be technical on the next slide, but uh, here's the slogan that I hope that you will remember. It's how I think about it. Um, ideal classes in this class set of O, this non-commutative class set, in the indefinite case are completely determined by congruence conditions on their reduced norms. So as complicated as you may have thought it might have been to check if a right ideal, the J is the one we're interested in right now, is principal. In fact, all that matters is its norm. That's the power of uh, strong approximation. So to set this up, I need a little bit of notation. Sorry that this is coming at the end. Um, you have to take the, uh, since we're thinking locally, it is much more convenient to set up that notation. So you let Z hat as usual be the product of the ZPs, Q hat the finite Adels. And I remind you that the class set of Z is given by choosing a local generator, which is well-defined up to units, up to a global generator. So that's written here. The Q hat cross is the local generator. The Z hat cross is the, uh, the discrepancy of that local generator because you can always multiply by local units and this determines its global class. So here the class of Z is just the trivial group. But the nice thing is that this same thing works for quaternions. If you let O be the product of the OPs, um, which is just O tensor Z hat, and you let B be the quaternionic finite Adels, then you get the same type of description here. If I take a right ideal, um, I choose a local generator that's well-defined up to local units, and the B hat cross on the left is telling you what the class is. All right, so this allows me to state strong approximation. Remember the slogan, 
Um, this was the class set that we did on the previous slide. And the statement of strong approximation or a corollary of it um, is that the reduced norm map, so this is the set that I want to understand, you know, where J belongs in it to ident identify what's going on, um, is really determined by what its norm is inside this group. So I didn't mod out by all of Z hat cross here. I only modded out by what I can get from reduced norms. So to determine what happens in my, uh, in my case of the quaternion order, um, I have to tell you what that reduced norm is. So here's an example of what this looks like. Maybe we uh, ignore at the end of this talk um, what the norms look like at uh, two adically. And again, let G be the GCD of C and D, or now, now let G be the GCD of C and D. Here's what the calculation with the uh, reduced norms looks like. This is what the class set is. So I take a product over FP cross mod FP cross squared. I take all the odd primes that divide the GCD of C and D. So I take the product of that elementary abelian two group, you know, one for every prime dividing the GCD of C and D. And I mod out that group by plus or minus one. It's a pretty nice elementary description. I hope I captured the spirit of the slogan of strong approximation that to understand, you need to look at congruous classes. That's all that's required. So for example, you can tell when this class set is trivial. So first of all, it could be when the GCD is equal to one itself, but you could get a little bit further if you notice that G was just a single prime L that's three mod four. Do you guys see that? Uh, in that case, there's only one factor here and minus one is a non-square. So that looks a little complicated. If I told you that there is an obstruction or there isn't an obstruction, depending on whether um, the GCD has a prime divisible by three or one mod four, that's still a congruence obstruction. That's how, what strong approximation is guaranteeing, but it might not have been obvious that that's the type of thing that was relevant for our, um, for our original problem. But here it is, it's in terms of quaternionic Okay, so there's our obstruction. We have all the list of elements. So um, uh, here's our general result. Um, maybe I'll just display it here um, and uh, remark what we've done over the course. This is just a summary slide of everything that we proved. Um, so first, uh, the easiest statement to prove that comes about is just uh, you can solve the unsigned equation but you can't assume that U and V separately are norms, just the product of them are norms. If you have, uh, if you wanna solve um, the signed equation, there may be an obstruction. At least if the GCD is one, you can further take them separately to be norms. And strong approximation really is strong in the sense that um, you really can find infinitely many U and V that satisfy any allowable congruence conditions. And um, I didn't come about this problem and neither did uh, Donald or Xavier from just the splendorous nature of the Bazoo equation. Um, the original motivation had to do with counting the number of inequivalent ways of writing a generalized Coomer service X in the form A mod G, where G is a group of order three acting on a abelian surface after you desingularize. That has to do with certain embedding numbers in a quaternion order that arises naturally from the Hodge structure on the... Anyway, after you boil everything down, you end up needing to solve the Bazoo equation, which is a really wonderful thing. So it's a, an entirely ahistorical talk in the way that we derived the material, but otherwise, I hope, historically illuminating in what we refer to by the Bazoo identities. And the upshot is uh, um, the quaternion, by reframing it as a question about quaternions, you really can understand and study the Diophantine equation and depending on the conditions that you want, um, you can uh, be as precise as you need to be. Thanks very much for your attention.